Ah, it's overreaction week two in the NFL 2022. I'm here with Ron, and this is going to be interesting. We don't have anything to sell you. We're not going to waste your time with introductions and all this other crap. This is what our process is each and every week in some sort of a form or fashion. This is actually a little earlier. We usually talk later in the week, but we wanted to get out something that relates to our video that we did last week, which was going through each game and uh, managing expectations so that it would help us not overreact during overreaction week two. So uh, with no further time wasted, Ron, how did week one go for you in a nutshell? And are you glad we did that uh that, that video last week to manage expectations because things got a little loopy uh, after these results on Sunday. Well, uh, it kept me grounded in terms of understanding about the video and kind of honing in. It was more of, we did that video and I said, okay, I'm not going to overreact. And one of the reasons I wasn't going to overreact is because I had strong opinions on unpopular teams last week. Uh, Chicago, as many people know, if they've watched us during the entire summer, um, they know that I felt that San Francisco wasn't ready to start. They knew that I thought that Seattle, that uh, Cincinnati wasn't ready to start. And they knew how I felt about Buffalo and how the Rams were finally facing an opponent um, where they couldn't just rest everybody in August, snap their fingers, hide a Stafford surgery and say, hey, we're going to beat the presumed number one team in the AFC. So um, those were my three strongest plays. They weren't secrets and uh, and they really delivered. And I think just us going through what we did last week just reinforced the fact that I didn't think those would be surprises. And if people think that they're surprised that Chicago beat San Francisco and they're going to upgrade them. Uh, maybe don't upgrade Chicago and keep. And if you had San Francisco too high, then you better downgrade them. But I graded San Francisco not where I think they're going to be in, in December, but I graded them at exactly where I thought they'd be in September. So that's my takeaway, Chris. Uh, I want to point out that there were 11 teams that did not play their starting quarterback in preseason, and only three of them ended up winning. Uh, 10 teams. Um, basically didn't play their starters in preseason, and three of those teams won. So I point that out that even some of these teams that did play some starters, there was a lot of rust spread throughout the league last week as far as I'm concerned, and uh, um, we're not going to rehash what's happened in the previous years, but without exception, every single year after week one, there are teams that just look so bad or look so good that it's extremely hard not to change your opinion on. And uh, I know my number one goal, I don't have a bet in yet because I think it's a difficult week. And um, I, I just want to kind of process. I'm disappointed personally with the way I bet last week, even though I won. And I'm trying to learn from that process. And then what I want to tell people is just because you win doesn't mean you did a great job of betting. And just because you lose, doesn't mean that you didn't do an excellent job of betting. So it's uh, it's how you manage the information that you have and you take advantage of it. So, uh, uh, you know, I think that's important to say to people. You know, just a quick game by game uh, from what happened last week. We had the Buffalo Rams. I kind of thought Buffalo might have been uh, – uh, might be running into some problems somewhere around, you know, across the, the, the season here. They haven't punted the ball in three out of four games. I mean, they're looking pretty tough. The Rams looked abysmal. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm not going to change my opinion on either team yet. I want to see some more. Anything uh, in, the, in that game change your opinion on anything? Absolutely nothing. I expected a steamroll. I got a steamroll. I was very happy with the way it played out. The Rams are exactly where they are before the season to where I think they are now. Same with Buffalo. No changes for me. Yeah, and I, I believe that we also uh, uh, referenced that the Rams were a potential teaser buster. 
uh, that we would not consider San Francisco as a teaser item just because that could be a goofy game. And uh, we weren't going near Tampa Bay, uh, Dallas uh, uh, teasers. So, I, we and did you know, what? I'm not I'm not a big teaser guy, so I, I right. let you carry the load on that. But even if I was week one is such a dangerous place exactly. to have teases, just too way too dangerous for me. Well, and I think this week is dangerous also. Um, New Orleans, Atlanta. I think we kind of alluded to the fact that we expected uh, bad teams to bring uh, maximum effort and to make games interesting. And uh, I don't remember specifically what we said about the Saints, but there's nothing that happened in that game that's changed my opinion yet. I, New Orleans finished very strongly. They got their act together near the end of the game, and that's something to build off of. Uh, what, thoughts on that game? Yeah, uh, there were, um, one thing we referenced – and one thing I've talked about for years and years and years, because I write a report that talks about does the preseason matter? And for Atlanta, it did. Mariota kind of fit the system. For Houston, it did. Levy Smith got a lot of work out of the people. We'll talk about that one later. For Denver, it did because they didn't do anything. But back to Atlanta, this is a divisional game. They know each other. Um, coaches, you know, the defensive coordinator is now the head coach, so nothing else changed there. Um, and unfortunately for Atlanta, what didn't change also is that they can't protect leads. Atlanta was the better team on Sunday, but lost the game. And get ready to hear that about three or four times during the season. No changes for either team on my end. I have no changes in the uh, my opinion on the Pittsburgh-Cincinnati uh, matchup. Uh, I think we pretty much pegged that one, mm -hmm. um, frankly, although... Uh, Pittsburgh had some casualties with some injuries and uh, Cincinnati was a turnover machine. Um, you know, they, they, they did the same thing they did last year and they came away with a, a, a victory week one. And then uh, Pittsburgh laid a, a turd sandwich against the Raiders week two, the following week. Uh, did you pick up any, anything worthwhile from this game? Uh, actually, I did, and it might surprise a lot of people because I still think the schedule and the peaks and valleys are going to do in Cincinnati. Too many short weeks, long weeks. First time uh, Zach Taylor rested his starters in the preseason, it showed. Um, basically, after all was said and done, I actually upgraded Cincinnati a little, which is going to be surprising. But they almost won the game despite a 7-1 sack ratio and a plus-5 turnover differential for Pittsburgh. I mean, to actually be an extra point or a short field goal away from winning would have been stealing a game for Cincinnati. I think they're clearly the better team as compared to Pittsburgh, uh, but the week one placement was was rough for them. I like Cincinnati as a team. I just think they're in traditional Sunday games. I'm going to be willing to back them when they're short rests, long rests and stuff like that. That's when we get into coach preparation. That's a different story. Um. I, you know what? I, I had a high opinion with Cincinnati. We talked about it, that they could be a better team and still finish in last on that division. So yeah. uh, I'm still sticking by it. I mean, that offensive line didn't protect Burrow. Uh, you know, yeah. how long is he going to last if uh, he has to face uh, a defense like that uh, in his in his face yeah. immediately all the time? I, I kind of expected a little bit more from Trubisky. Uh, yeah. Still going to wait and see. Uh, but a uh, little disappointed we didn't get more than 200 yards passing out of them. Um, so that's all I gleaned from that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, Pittsburgh's got some problems, uh, kind of worried about it. Uh, these teams with these injury bugs, it's just disappointing. Whoops. Uh, Sorry. Do, uh, <laughs> um, um, one more thought on the, on Pittsburgh. Um if we talk about injuries, J.J. Watt is worth about three quarters of a point to me, maybe even a point, because yeah. of not just what he brings to the sack total, but now somebody else gets double teamed if T.J. Watt's not on the field. I mean, if J.J. Watt's not on the field. So it's an unfortunate loss for Pittsburgh. But, you know, there's a dozen injuries week one due to a variety of factors and the teams that have to face it. Um, my condolences to them. It's tough. 
Well, he was going to see a second doctor. Is there, has there been an update to me when you say you're going to see a second doctor? That kind of means you're trying to avoid surgery. Uh, uh, yeah. you, One way or another, he's missing next week, and he's probably going to miss a few weeks. I think he's going to miss a lot of weeks. I think that that's uh, one of the more difficult uh, uh, pec injuries, one of the more difficult things to recover from, I think. But uh, yeah. Philadelphia, Detroit. Um, I tweeted it out. Detroit's my backdoor buddies because all they do is backdoor games. So <laughs> obviously completely uh, not in the game. Uh, they picked up uh, a lot of their yardage and garbage time once again. So they kind of followed the same routine as last year. Uh, but they actually got out to a lead early on, which we, we did not see last year. But that still didn't do them any good. Philadelphia kind of took over. Um, I still am not convinced Philadelphia is all that. Um, I kind of expected a little bit of a better effort from the Lions. So I'm, my ears are kind of perked up there. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, I wrote the uh, week one overreaction article. Um, you can click on, uh, I'll, I'll tweet it out later. But these are the same teams we saw at the end of last year. Philadelphia. Taylor did its offense around Hertz. They got themselves a good wide receiver. Everything worked fine. And they gave up splash plays like they'd been doing all of last year and week one this year. Detroit, hey, if you can keep running back swift on the off, uh, you know, healthy, that's good. I mean, he looks good. He's kind of an exciting runner. But this is the same old team. You know, Goff in the fourth quarter might be the MVP of the league. But Goff in the first, second, and third quarters – Maybe not so much. Uh, I, you know, the Lions have to learn how to win. Uh, we talked about this on previous vid videos. A lot of teams, a lot of coaches, they have to go through those baby steps of learning how to win. Uh, for me, we'll see what the Lions are like week 14. But <laughs> if week one's any indication, I haven't changed anything about either team. This is exactly how it played out. Um, but the Lions are already playing for 2023. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 there is no uh, – the, the pressure on the Lions is just to do better than last year and show some progress and right. uh, along those lines. They're, 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 they're not going to do too much. Carolina, Cleveland, uh, about what I expected, a close-knit game. Um, it went the direction I wanted it to. Uh, the one surprise I got out of this was McCaffrey was strangely uh, – um, not really involved uh, like in years past. Have these injuries caught up with him over the last two seasons? Uh, did you watch any of that game? What have you picked up about uh, McCaffrey's lack of uh, participant or, uh, performance? Um, I think it's uh, load management. I don't read anything in the week one as first week back. I will say I watched a highlight, uh, a couple of highlights of what he did. His cutting was amazing. He made three people miss on a particular nine yard first down run. I'm not really worried about him. It's going to take him a few games. I applaud them for being careful with him. Uh, they can't, Carol, and this game was a toss up game from the get go. It was a toss up game in July, August, and when it was played. I had no idea who was going to win. Um, I thought Baker Mayfield would have ups and downs emotionally in the game. That did happen. But Matt Rule can't afford to lose these games, even though technically there was a blown referee call at the end of the game that should have been intentional grounding. Makes a difference between a win and a loss there. Could, could affect both teams and both co uh, could affect Matt Rule, could affect Cleveland's ability to make the playoffs. You hate to see a referee call impact a game. But basically, if they played this game 100 times, I think it would have been 50-50. I'm not changing a thing. Yeah, I kind of uh, uh, there's there's more to learn from uh, each of these teams. Uh, uh, no major reactions for me. We we discussed the San Francisco Bears game a little bit already. Um, the 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 one thing that I've noticed is is Lance's completion percentage is like fifty three or fifty four percent, and he's had a handful of op you know games to operate within and. Uh, they were discussing it on the on, on Colin's show today. The, the the worst quarterback completion percentage in the playoffs last year was 61%. So he's not even remotely close to um, being where he needs to be. 
Um, you can give him the excuse, bad weather, the road, everything like that. Um, I think he's still got a handful of games before people are going to start, you know, clamoring for a possible Garoppolo sighting. Uh, the, the, the Bears showed a little bit of life, though. It was kind of nice to see. I don't know how long that'll last. But I, I'm not going to – I think you said you're downgrading San Francisco. I'm not ready to downgrade them yet. Uh, no, I didn't, I'm not downgrading them. I, had already, I already had a low number compared to everybody else okay. because I saw this coming. So I don't need to change. Everybody else needs to change. But I will say this about um, San Francisco, and it's very telling. I don't know if you heard this, Chris, um, but on Thursday or Friday, word got out that Kyle Shanahan went to his coaches and his players, 15 exactly, 15 players, and he said, if things don't go well early in the season, we need you to rally around Trey Lance. We don't want you to have division in the locker room and ask for Jimmy G and so on and so forth. That statement, when it came out, was just, to me, so telling that Kyle Shanahan knew where the pulse of his team was right now, and he knew Lance wasn't ready. Just yeah. like when they, when they substituted um, Kaepernick for Alex Smith a few years back before Shanahan was there, it wasn't what he was going to be that minute. It's what the ceiling was for Kaepernick compared to Alex Smith, who was more of a, you know, methodical push the field, you know, push the game down the field. Jimmy Garoppolo, Jimmy G, he has a ceiling. Trey Lance has a bigger floor, but he has a bigger ceiling as well. I think that statement made on Friday and rallying um, was so telling that I just think San Francisco is going to have a rough month. Yeah, I think they're, the, you know, Kittle was out. Um, yeah. You know, the, the deck was kind of stacked against him for this this first game. I don't like exactly what you just said. I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's okay. especially if it comes out in public, it's just inexcusable. That tells you that the fact that it was made public uh, is more telling than anything else. So, um, but at some point, if this team continues, you know, along this path, he's not going to have a choice. He's going to have to, you know, to bench Lance at some point, in my opinion. Two Indianapolis, two things, uh, yeah. pardon me? Two things to close up on that one. You, you've you heard me say it way too many times. Young quarterbacks need a stout offensive line and a tall target at tight end. What you said about Kittle not playing was big. Alex yeah. Mack retired their long time, you know, long time stalwart in the NFL as offensive center. That's big. Two big losses rookie quarterbacks um, have trouble overcoming early. So I just add that all the fuel pointed to a Chicago great showing in this game. It doesn't mean Chicago's great team. It just means the situation was good. Yeah, I, I had a handful of people reach out to me on San Francisco teasers, and I said, nope, I, I think they'll win, but I wouldn't tease them because yeah. things could go south. Uh, the Colts-Texans, that was a surprising game for me uh, in some respects, but we talked about it, and – a lot of veterans, a lot of turnover yeah. of the veteran coach, um, you know, good quarterback, the, you know, with some tools. Uh, we didn't expect Texans to lay down and, and certainly didn't have the impression that they were going to be at the very bottom of the league like in years past. And I think that they showed exactly that. And Indianapolis, once again, starts off slow. Uh they, I think that they need more time together to gel, and, and that'll straighten them up, though. Uh, no changes for either team, but ears perked a little bit on Colts. How about you? Okay, well, um, I think you made a good point last week in terms of the veterans that are on Houston, and I coupled that with the fact that I love the work that uh, Houston did um, getting ready for this game. You didn't have linebacker Leonard for Indianapolis. The one thing I, I mentioned last week that – um, you kind of concurred with is that I was hoping with the new defensive coordinator, Indy would change their scheme, but in the preseason, it was the same old stuff, 72%. So if they're not going to change, why would you back them giving points, you know, when they have such a soft defense? Um, I'm not changing anything. I'd love to change Houston a little higher, but Lovey Smith lost that game. I mean, this is 2022, if I'm correct. It's not 1999. Lovey Smith's punts, curious punts, and the decision to play for the tie in overtime 
was ridiculously stupid. I'm sorry not to uh, mince words there or to mince words there, but uh, Levy Smith couldn't get his team over the hump with a, didn't they have a double digit lead in that game? Uh, they had a huge know. lead. Yeah. Yeah. So the bottom line is Houston was a better team. And we may be saying that a few times this year as Houston piles up the losses because uh, the coaching staff is going to hold them back in my opinion. Well, and, and Houston's getting a big number we'll get to later, but uh, they gave up 62% to Mills, uh, 23 for t- uh, 37 98.9 passer rating. Uh, he had a better game than Matt Ryan. So I, I think that that's the reason why Houston's going to be uh, surprising in some games this season. Yeah. Uh, Patriots, Dolphins, that was a big disappointment. Uh, he, I just thought the Patriots would come with a little bit more than they did. But, you know, there's a lot of miss. You know, if you look at the, the visual highlights, the game really wasn't that different uh you know if you analyze the box scores the game was closer than than one would think but miami certainly did look good and that's one of the teams that might uh have people overreacting in this week too um i it just seems like jones just doesn't have any time to throw the ball and he doesn't have the people to throw the ball too uh easily they can't they don't get any separation uh, it's just really tough on a young quarterback, but under the circumstances that he had to play in, I haven't heard anybody, uh, in the know, not praise him for how well he did under those circumstances, quite frankly. So even though they lost, it wasn't a Mac, Mac Jones problem. What are your thoughts? Uh, New England graded out well defensively, but, um, I think with Ted, all three of us said this was the game we were most looking forward to because we wanted to see how New England's lack of speed and Miami's new schemes, how fast would go there. It was a very uncertain game to me. And like you, I expected more out of New England. But boy, that coach, you know, the coach in Miami, he has grown on me you know, each and every week. And we kind of alluded to that when we did the previews in the summer. His decision with 24 seconds left, fourth and seven from the 42-yard line, which resulted in a 42-yard TD, was golden. I mean, that was analytics at its best. If you miss the field goal, then the other team takes over at the 49, not the 42. If you punt it, um, obviously you're not getting any points on it. If you go for it and you miss, it's still just the 42-yard line. New England hadn't scored at the time. And there's only about 18 seconds left in the game. Um, and then Waddle got free and he broke free for the touchdown. I, I just like the way Miami managed the game. And um, that's sitting with me a little. I did, have to adjust, I did have to adjust my numbers in this game. One of the few that I had to adjust. Because I had these teams virtually even. And even though New England tends to lose at Miami a lot, so I can't read too much into that. I I kind of like how Miami fared against New England. And it may be one of those situations where even though the metrics said New England should still be about nine and eight this year, um, team speed bothers me, the lack of team speed. Yeah, no, I agree. It's, uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how New England uh, comes back this week. And if Miami can show that they're consistent, uh, um, Jacksonville and Washington, I don't know what, what there was to learn from that game as far as I'm concerned. And I think we kind of predicted that because, uh, it, th- that was going to be a wait and see result regardless. Uh, it, lots of goofy things happened in that game and Washington came out with the win. Uh, Jacksonville probably should have looked a little bit better as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but uh, and nothing burger for me. How about you? Let me sum it up in four words so that we can get on to the next game. Someone had to win. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kansas City looked uh, like world beaters. And that's another team that I thought might uh, face some uh, obstacles along the way, especially with their first seven games they have to play. Arizona certainly, I think, was the number one. Were they potentially the number one most disappointing team this week uh, where people may overreact? Uh, 
I want to overreact, but I'm not going to. Uh, just everything Kansas City did was right, and Arizona looked like crap. Uh, let's see what happens this week. Yeah, my my feeling is that I came very close to playing Arizona, but the injuries held me back. If not, I mean, one injury wouldn't hold me back. Right. I mean, they can be overrated, but we were talking about four injuries. We're talking about didn't they miss um, – JJ Watt, which is obviously important. Um, they obviously, you know, they had, they, we knew they didn't have a good secondary going in. They're missing one of their uh, wide receiver options, Rondale Moore. Um, you know, the vibe just wasn't right on this team. I, I really thought the line was a little high. Uh, but it, when all said and done, I just, and I've said this a lot, I don't like Arizona's coaching staff, I don't like Arizona's defensive coaching staff. I didn't change Kansas City, but I did change Arizona because I want them, even if I change them a little bit too low, I'd rather right now be a little bit too low on Arizona than a little bit too high because I, I don't like the culture that's going on right now. I, I, I agree with you there. and uh, um, I just want to talk about market reading for a moment. When that Kansas City line hit six, six and a half, you know, I saw people rushing – you know, some people rushing to take Arizona. They thought the line was out of sight there. But my immediate reaction was, there's something I don't know. I don't want any of the Arizona. And uh, instead of just blindly immediately taking that line that looked absurd, you got to, you know, investigate further. And you got to be able to smell out these fishy type lines. And I'm glad I did because, you know, me five years ago would have pounded Arizona and thought it was nuts. Well, well said, and we talked off air about it. And so that was a good conversation because I would have done the same thing. I said, well, you know, I don't care if there's one injury on Arizona, but there was just a little bit more to it. And I, I thought there was a smart reason why that line jumped off. Not at first I didn't think that, right. but after, after thinking about it more. Well, and it held, too. When you saw yeah. it reach those levels and it holds. Yeah. That, that, that's a real warning sign. Great like, point. Green Bay, Minnesota went uh, pretty much the way I thought it was going to be uh, with Minnesota. Game one, Green Bay laid an egg last year. Game one, uh, I, I thought that he, uh, Rodgers would have real problems meshing with the receivers. I thought their defense would perform well, and they did hold the Vikings down uh, and shut them down for a good portion of the game. But they had some glaring, you know, you know, invitations for Je Jefferson to just wander free. And uh, I think he had 165 first uh, half yards. So uh, I don't learn anything from this game yet. I, I, I guess I, I, I want to join the Vikings bandwagon. But after one game, I'm not going to because I don't really know what this Green Bay team is about. And it's only one game. Uh and I'm not throwing the towel into Green Bay either. Their defense is stout, and at some point, uh, the, the the offense should gel a little bit better. What about you, Ron? Well, this is a point where I do two things. I pat myself on the back for how well prepared I was for week one, and I smack myself in the face for being so late to the Minnesota week one. I should have had that team. Because I didn't have the game, and when I finally figured it out, Minnesota was already favored. So, you know, that's on me, but, you know, I'm okay. I did a lot of other things. This was such a big game for Minnesota. You can't lose game yes. one at home with three rookie wide receivers and all of Green Bay's missing parts, and their left tackle didn't end up playing in the game for Green Bay. And we've seen the story before from Green Bay. Embarrassed week one, division titleist by the end of the season. So I won't change a thing. I, I may change Minnesota slightly up because I like the post-Zimmer chemistry in the locker yeah. room. I wrote about this. Football is fun again in Minnesota. And, you know, we, we both know that Cousins is a good, accurate quarterback. Yeah, well, I agree. I, I, I agree with what you said. Is If Minnesota came away with that L, boy, that, yeah. that might have – might have been a problem for yeah. a new coaching staff and 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 for gelling yeah. together. The disappointment might have yeah. been something uh, that would have affected future performance. But it went to, it went as kind of planned. Giants yeah. Titans. I, I've as I mentioned, Titans were never a top ten team last year. 
I saw some idiotic major site rank the Titans the eighth best team in the NFL coming into this week, which is absolute absurdity. I'm not even sure they'll be 18th. And uh, it's just amazing how some of these rankings, it looks like they, they're they picking out random balls like a lotto machine, just absolutely way off. And uh, wow. I, I don't know how they come up with it. But Giants did uh, – Giants uh, – you know, showed signs of life. I mean, uh, it was good to see that. It's good to kind of see this turnover a little bit. And Tennessee obviously uh, blew it. And uh, I, I'm surprised that they, they lost this at home. Uh, I think that, that uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they respond going forward because that's not a game they're supposed to lose. Yeah, you know something? It was 13-0 Tennessee, and they had left points on the table. Um, then they started to have a couple of turnovers. The Giants weren't in this game. The Giants weren't ready week one. No. But facing Tennessee was a blessing for them. And in the end, the Tennessee fire drill that we call that sort of 47-yard field goal attempt when they could have run one more play and gained a few more yards. I hate when teams position the ball for a field goal instead of getting a few more yards. Um, that shouldn't happen with veteran coaches. And I think we've seen Tennessee make a couple of moves like that. I would have been down on the Giants, other than the fact that obviously a coaching upgrade. But two things excite me about the Giants moving forward, even though I think it's, you know, this is still a learning year. Barkley looked good. Yeah. And now, very two good. years removed from injury, that's a great sign. And I love the way that this staff that molded Josh Allen and Buffalo molded Daniel Jones to go 17 of 21. Let me repeat that. For those who don't believe those numbers, 17 of 21, Daniel Jones. And they were ridiculing him all over Twitter. I mean, the, 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 you know, somewhere around the uh, end of the first quarter, beginning of the second quarter, I mean, they were getting the business. And uh, it, it, it's just really impressive. It's something that they can build on. The coach said the right things. The two-point conversion may not have been the right choice, but it worked. And... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know, teams can uh, kind of build off of this. It's a, with, you got a new energy there. You don't know how what's going to go on with them, and this is going to be a really interesting game with uh, Carolina Raiders. Hey, Chargers. Uh, go ahead. Before you go to that, if you have a hat handy, can you put four names into it? <laughs> Dallas, Philly, Washington, and New York Giants. Division leader. Blindly put one in, take one out because who knows who's favored now. Yeah, I, 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 I was watching a show where somebody had taken Philadelphia to win the division laying juice minus 150. And I'm like, I wouldn't be laying 150 on that. Uh, yeah. You can't count out the Giants. You can't out, count out Washington. Um, and yeah. you yourself did not show, you know, Philadelphia did not look like a world beater by any means. So yeah. uh, Raiders, Chargers, I think that that's exactly what we kind of expected. Uh um, Carr made a lot more mistakes than uh, normal. Uh, I think he'll correct that. But uh, the Raiders actually looked pretty good. Uh, the Chargers looked pretty solid at times, but they let the Raiders back in. A uh, little mild concern there, but kind of what I expected. What about you? Well, I, again, broken record, but if this game is not played in week one, I don't touch it. This is the perfect storm for the Chargers. We talked mm -hmm. about it so often about immediate playoff revenge, what it means. The Raiders, um, the only difference with the Chargers is that they have a better secondary than the Raiders. In fact, a much better secondary than the Raiders. Um, but if you look at the stat sheet, the Chargers won the sack battle with Khalil Mack doing what we all hoped he would do. I mean, actually jumpstart that. So they won he had the sack a great battle. Game. Yeah, he got three of their six sacks, I believe. Six zero in sacks, plus three in turnovers. Yet the we had, Vegas had a chance to win at the end. To me, Vegas and Devontae Adams and Derek Carr showed me more than the Chargers did. But because of the circumstances, the Chargers were the right play week one. So I'm not down on the Chargers at all, but I'm a little higher on the on Vegas than I was going in. Yeah, these teams are a little bit closer than I kind of had in my brain, so to speak. Uh, 
And, I, and, and as I mentioned previously, I'm really disappointed with the way I bet last week. And then leaving the Chargers on the table was a was an egregious mistake. I, I just really yeah. like the Chargers, and I don't know why I stayed, stayed off of it. Tampa well, Bay way- Cowboys. Tampa Bay Cowboys just uh, what a dud game. Uh, th- this is th- the Cowboys actually are the ones that everybody's bailing on. I-, I can't believe we've gone from Dallas minus two to plus eight because uh, Prescott is out. Uh, mm-hmm. We've got an overreaction in that line as far as I'm concerned. But geez, did, did the balloon pop already with this team uh, fizzle out? What, what are your thoughts? Mm-hmm. Well, this is um, my one straight loss last year. I mean, last week. I had plus three in Dallas. I bet that, you know, a long time ago. It was pretty much two and a half, three a lot during the summer. And I, I, I think the biggest takeaway, I have a lot of takeaways from this game while Dak was healthy. Number one, Tampa stiffened their pass defense, which surprised me a little bit. But they're capable of doing that. They just hadn't played that way. But they miss Rob Gronkowski. I'm, I'll talk, get to Dallas in a minute, but Tampa's 19 points is not great against the Dallas defense. They no. settled for five field goal attempts, made four out of five in the first half. Rob Gronkowski is that security blanket for Tom Brady in the red zone, and he wasn't anywhere near the field. And so um, no need to upgrade Tampa just yet, even though Tom Brady you know, has defied age. As for Dallas, Dak Prescott's pass percentage, low, like we said, uh, this is a listless team. I mean, it's just there was nothing to like about them in terms of their body language, in terms of their preparation, in terms of their roster development. I mean, what they did is be so passive in the draft. In free agency, they were passive. Before the season with another offensive line injury, they were passive. I mean, what... I mean, I I think in terms of overreaction Monday, I said this last year with Atlanta, and I'm going to say with Dallas, this is the one team I think it's acceptable to overreact on. This is a bad situation for Dallas. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I was kind of feeling the same way. I, I looked the same way as that Kansas City, Arizona line, but a but it, but different. I, I, I sat there and I go, boy, I got to take that plus eight right now. And uh, I started thinking about it, and it just, God, it just seems like this team could be even more listless and, and, and just more defeated uh, when they come out next game, for all we know, uh, especially uh, versus a team, you know, coming off, uh, you know, a hard luck loss themselves. Three points. I mean, that's just unacceptable in today's NFL. I understand that they didn't have all their receivers, but they had C.D. Lamb. They had Schultz. They had uh, Pollard, who breaks tackles yeah. in terms of his. I mean, there's there's not that much of an excuse to score just three points. Monday night football. I I, I stayed away from it and regretted it because I, I I just didn't have enough time to put into it, and I kind of realized uh, it was silly to not have bet Seattle. I certainly didn't expect them to necessarily win the game, but. Uh, Denver was one of those teams, new coaching staff, but they sat their starters uh, in preseason, correct? They sat their starters. Um, The the biggest takeaway here, well, two takeaways. Number one, the line was way off. When the line clicked to seven, that was, I mean, I don't have Denver rated as a top 10 team. Why would you? Um, At least that's my personal opinion. And Seattle was rated near the bottom, but my line clicked out at four and a half. So seven was, and I was off the game until it hit seven because I had other things that I thought to do, but seven was a great security blanket. But Denver's use of clock management may have been the worst I've seen in the modern era. 321 on the clock, needing a field goal to win and three timeouts. And they ended up, uh, what did they, they called their first timeout with 20 seconds left from the 47 yard line with one second left on the play clock. Why aren't they calling timeouts during the drive? Um, It almost looked like they said, you know, we don't really know how to coach the two minute drill. Let's just wing it and see what happens. Oh, we have Russell Wilson. Well, do we trust him or do we not trust? I mean, that was beyond belief 
Um, that whole drive, everybody's holding them to why did they try the 64 yard field goal? I don't think that's the problem. The problem is why did that drive unfold the way it did? And why were three timeouts left on the table for no reason? That coaching staff better get their act together fast because uh, I, there's not going to be a, any more patience for that uh, in the least because uh, there are just a lot of bad stuff in that game. And, you know, I had the over. I can't believe that game didn't go over. But, yeah, well, uh, it's uh, bad luck with uh, all the one yard things. But by the way, I'm not I'm not upgrading Seattle for the game. You know, oh, no this way. Was, this was kind of like a playoff game for them. The atmosphere was electric. Mm -hmm. um, they are what they are. It's just that Denver better coach better or they might get downgraded down the road. That was that was a sloppy game for them. I think Geno Smith has covered the spread eight straight games. Nine. Um, but I did see some – I remember in the back of my head that uh, he's pretty easy to figure out um, in his previous stints, his backup. Uh, yeah, he comes in you know, and gives optimism and then just peters out. But, you know, this is a situation where quarterback is holding the clipboard for a couple of years and can, uh, you know, mature and gather a lot of knowledge and, and improve, uh, you know – what we're used to seeing from them. And uh, this is potentially a situation like that. Uh, what do you think, Brian? Uh, I love the game plan in the first quarter. He, I mean, everybody's expecting 20 runs from running back Penny and he came out firing. I don't think Denver was prepared for that offensive attack. I think Pete Carroll said, Hey, I love the challenge of this year. And with Jamal Adams gone from the secondary, it's an even greater challenge because that's a pretty poor secondary. Um, and he just came out and said, in fact, I don't know if you saw this quote today, but he he said, we want to force Russell Wilson to go to the left because his pass percentage statistics are not good when he has to throw from the left side of the field. I mean, now everybody's little, gonna do that. <laughs> yeah, these are little nuggets that are coming out. I just think there was a coaching preparation difference in this game. Um I think Seattle will have their problems, but there's no question they're going to compete week in and week out. Well, they had a key injury uh, there. Uh, yeah, Jamal Adams. That's a bad one. Do we know how long he's going to be out? At least two months. Ugh, okay. Um, we've been on for a while, so why don't we, instead of going game by game, are there any games or situations uh, that kind of stand out to you? Uh, that you're looking at or, um, you know, just any sort of things that stick out to you at this point? I'm perusing the schedule right now. And I admit, um, as you know, Chris, that I, I am so busy before kickoff week one and, and getting my futures ready, my player props, finishing up with the college and everything that week two kind of slides by. Um, so, I'm, you know, I'm just formulating stuff. I, the first reaction is, okay, we got five double digit favorites this week. So it, it's going to be a completely different week. It's going to be some favorites are going to just knock over the other teams. Um, my, my reaction, New England Pittsburgh is an interesting game. Want to get your thought. I think Pittsburgh's going to be completely fatigued in this game. The question is how healthy is quarterback Jones for New England? He has a back issue. And the, and the question is, um, are we going to allow Joe Judge and Matt Patricia in the room when we're designing a game plan? Or can we lock the door because uh, they're just bad karma when it comes out there? Um, but I do think Pittsburgh is going to feel its legs. It's going it, to there's going to be fatigue there. And then the teams like Atlanta and Houston that put out such great efforts this past week only to lose or tie. Um, is that the best we're going to see? Are we going to see regression from those teams because they're not very good? What are your first impressions? Um, you know what? It seems like that Rams line is a little bit overinflated, frankly. Um, even if Atlanta just doesn't play well, you know, it just – I don't know how you can lay 10 and a half on that game, frankly. It's it, Not that I'm looking to, to, to play on Atlanta. It just seems a little high to me. Um, I might disagree there. Um, situationally, there's some situations favor the Rams and power rating. I have them at 11. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not looking to play Atlanta there. It just seems like 
just seems like he could be a 10. I mean, uh, there's a difference there. Um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with this Houston Denver game. I, I still say, I, I don't, how can you expect Denver off a short week to, to have their act together by Sunday? They could win ugly. There's no question about that. I, I have a feeling, Levy's the extra day and a half that Denver doesn't have, this coaching staff needs three and a half days to get ready. On paper, this is a double-digit win. Uh, I, I wouldn't trust either team. So It's just interesting, and uh, I, I guess I should have uh, led with, I've only bet 23 week two games in seven years, so it's a, mm -hmm. it's, it, I think it's the lowest volume week that I bet. Uh, I, 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 ex I expect to have three or fewer plays, straight plays this week. I think I'm going to be in that range also. Uh, yeah. I, I feel no hurry to do anything. Uh, you know, I don't feel compelled I have to do anything. I, I really want to just absorb. The Miami-Baltimore game is going to be very interesting. Baltimore, once again, loses, I, I think, four <laughs> key players. I, I mean, What's, I what's going on? What? <laughs> I don't know. It's something in the water there. But so that's a huge concern. I mean, I, you know, they're a deep team, so they've got some people that can fill in. Yeah. But if they lose any more people, we got to start worrying about our uh, Ravens futures as far as yeah. I can see. Now, both running backs that missed last year weren't ready to play week one and the running game suffered and Jackson was uh, contained in the pocket. Uh, you know, th that's a concern. Uh, Miami's defense is going to probably work on a lot. I mean, it's going to be tight end centric again for Baltimore in this game. But the, the first sign of trouble was when the mascot went down for the whole year on IR you know, you know, before the season. And it's just steamrolled since then. I mean, move back do, to Cleveland. Do you have a concern that Baltimore wasn't able to run on the Jets? Um, no, the Jets' strength is against the run. Okay. Which is why, which is why the Jets are no good because stopping the run is not necessarily predictive of of long term success, and the Jets have so many other problems. That's the Jets' strength. The problem is Miami is also decent against the run too, uh, but they're also decent against the pass, and they're they're a different team altogether. Um, but yeah, the Jets are one of the better run defenses. So then the Jets are uh, segueing into a similar type game game against the Browns because the Browns uh, their strategy was to kind of uh, ball control grind it out. And, and that's probably what they'd like to do this game too. Don't you think against the Jets? Yeah, I, I think you mentioned a little bit about uh, Brissett and I was disappointed in his play as well. Cleveland may be matchup proof with Chubb and Hub and Hunt running the ball. So that's still a little bit of a tough task for the Jets. The worry about the Jets is that, um, they're in a holding pattern with Joe Flacco. There's, uh, if you have Zach Wilson at quarterback, you have more mobility, you have a gunslinger approach, you'll have highs and you'll have lows. But with uh, Joe Flacco, you got a flatliner. I mean, you're, you basically, what does Cleveland have to do? And if Cleveland allows 20 points in this game, we've got a problem because Cleveland's deeper than that. Uh, you know, the, the Jets... I don't know. There's not much I could say about the Jets that's, that's really good right now. No, uh, everybody's extremely pessimistic. Uh, the only thing I glean from the Lions-Washington is the Lions, both of these teams better win. But I think yeah. more of the pressure is on Detroit to win. They need this game. Although Washington, you know, looks like a pretty interesting teaser option for those that are interested in teasers. Uh I just want to see what happens with this game. I doubt if I'll have a bet on it. I doubt if I would, too. I have situations that favor both teams. Uh, boy, if Washington gets out to 2-0 start, it doesn't matter that they play Jacksonville and Detroit because in the division, they're all toss-ups. Um, I agree. We talked about that. an amazing that. win for Washington. We, we mentioned uh, before the season started, everybody's ignoring Washington and not that we're predicting anything. No. We're just saying, hey, they could come out of nowhere. Uh, Tampa Bay and the Saints, that seems like an interesting line. And uh, that's moving off of the three. It's down to like a very strong two and a half week three. This is one of the lines that surprised me a little bit. I'm wondering if New Orleans had lost the game. Let's say the kick is no good. 
you know, are we seeing a five instead of a three as an opening number that, hey, New Orleans is 0-1 and Tampa just won, dominated Dallas defensively. I'm a little, I thought that the line would be higher. Do you, uh, what do you think about the momentum uh, generated versus a, a mediocre Atlanta team uh, that Winston was able to come back uh, from that huge deficit in the fourth quarter? Uh, is that momentum to build off of or false uh, uh, false hope? Hadn't thought about that. We'll have to give that some thought. I will say that I still think at the beginning of games, you're going to see New Orleans a, probably a little more conservative because that's just Dennis Allen. Dennis Allen, the last time he was a head coach, um, was one game last year when Sean Payton had COVID. It was against Tampa. And they won nine to nothing. So if you're going game planning in this game, New Orleans is probably going to think, hey, we don't have to do anything stupid offensively. We just need to do what we've been doing against Tom Brady defensively. So I would expect that momentum or no momentum, that they've got something in place that they think is going to work against Tampa. Uh, yeah, and this New Orleans team, you, you hit the nail on the head. It just seems like when they're a, when they're in that three and a half to six point favorite role, they they're gonna just always disappoint you and start off slow and 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 and, and you just never feel like you even have any hope to cover. It doesn't it seem that way the last couple of years. Um, let's not use the last couple of years. Let's use the last twenty five years. If you blindly bet every underdog in the New Orleans, New Orleans uh, games every season, you would have two losing seasons and you'd be about, I think you'd be in the very, very high 50%, 59% or so. Just blindly saying New Orleans is a favorite, fade them. New Orleans yeah. is a dog, take them. It's, it's just weird the way that's been working, especially divisionally. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, back to Panthers-Giants. Uh, Boy, that's a tough one. Uh, you know what? It's it, we, you know what we haven't mentioned are the zero and one teams. You know, against one and zero teams. Uh, that's a big trend that the, uh, the the team that did not win will get the win. So, I, I think that uh, you got to kind of look Carolina's way a, a little bit here. What do you think? You know, I can't get it out of my head that Carolina could have been one and zero, and the Giants could have been zero and one if the yeah. field goals were switched. I mean, they weren't that long a field goal. I mean, the, the Giants, Tennessee missed a 47-yarder. Carolina, they had that um, intentional grounding not happen, but Carolina lost on a 50-something-yard field goal. So is the mindset different if Carolina's 1-0 and and the Giants are 0-1? I mean, th those are the two games that could have easily been flipped. Um now, with that being said, I have to process that information to see what it means to me, because in reality, it's a dead even game. But something scares me about Carolina. Yeah, I, I, I think they're going to be a, a very a heavy teaser option uh, for the week. And again, this is I, this whole board. I just want to digest. I, 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 mm -hmm. I'm not even sure I'll come up with an opinion by Thursday evening. Uh I'm going to need some time to kind of just process this. We talked about the Patriots Steelers. I, I don't know what to expect from there. You, you said your piece on that game, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, if anything, I would look to new England because I would see fourth quarter fatigue from Pittsburgh. And, and I don't, I think can new England look any worse than they did last week offensively. And I, I don't think so. And maybe they get a break without Watt and uh, whatever else uh, Pittsburgh is missing there. Your San Francisco slid up from nine and a half. Uh, the remaining nine and a halfs are up to ten. Um, yeah, you yeah, know, I, I mean, I, if Kittle's in, I believe that Lance is going to, you know, really be able to show some progress. And if he doesn't, I think that that's going to be a problem. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I would probably have been actually bullish on San Francisco in this game. Uh, except for, um, I think there's a running back downgrade with Mitchell out of the game. You saw what yeah. happened in the second half of that game. Uh, Jeff Wilson is an average running back. I know a Kyle Shanahan scheme pretty much means that I could run three and a half yards per carry, although it would only be one carry because then I'd be in the IR. 
after being hit. But uh, I, I think it's too soon for Seattle off a high. San Francisco could possibly name the score, but again, we got Lance in September. We don't have Lance in November. You know, I don't do three-team teasers, but the 49ers, I rarely do three-team teasers, but the 49ers minus 10, Green Bay minus 10, and uh, Buffalo minus 10 just seems so uh, like those three teams are supposed to win, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, I could. I sort of understand that. You know, I almost ventured a, a thought that Carolina is probably a decent teaser because um, – Mayfield has a tendency to have close games. The Giants haven't blown anybody out. Maybe, yeah. you know, maybe for people who like teases, you get that over seven, you know, get it to an eight or more. Yeah. Um, you're in a good shape there. Um, but yeah, I think I think you're gonna see some blowouts this week. I think so. We've talked about Texans and then Broncos, uh, and uh, Arizona and the Raiders. Geez, up to six now. Probably deserve it so. Not that I would want a part of the Raiders, but uh, I would probably only look the dog root on this game, frankly. What about you? Uh, it's not a game I want to get involved in. I don't like Vegas as a favorite at that high number because nope. of their secondary. They're all, um, you saw it with the Eagles. You come from, you know, you're vulnerable to a backdoor cover. And Kyra Murray's good enough to have a backdoor cover. Just when doom and gloom, we talked about that, you know, Arizona, yeah. there's something wrong there, gloom and doom. But this is a good team to go against in terms of beating the secondary. It's not like they don't have some talent and some scheme that could work. So I, um, I don't really want to have a part of that game. No, I, I would be shocked if I, if I end up with a part. But uh, uh, Bears, Packers, I uh, if if well, uh, I I expect the Packers to do pretty well. I, I've got to imagine that their defense is going to really wreak havoc with the Bears. I think that the uh, the Bears are going to have a tough time scoring. Now, what do you think? It, it's a weird situation without Devonte Adams as a security blanket offensively. Um, but my metrics and my situations tell me that Green Bay is the only side to look at. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, those who know me know that uh, I'm an underdog better. That's, I mean, you have to know your strengths. Whoever you're handicapping, if you're good with favorites, if you're good with money lines, uh, if you've tracked your record, you and I have talked about it so long. My forte is underdogs. And the problem is there's not going to be a lot this week. You know, I have to narrow the board, um, which is fine. Like I said, three plays probably most is all I could see and not the standout plays that were available week one. Um, yeah, Green Bay will probably methodically turn drives into field goals, and maybe they win this game like 23 to 6 or something. Yeah, the total seems like uh, it might have some room for movement down, frankly. Uh, 42 at the current, 42 and a half. There's even yeah, a, right. ooh, there's a, strange, there's a stray 43 I might snag. Um Oh, and, and I didn't mention the Bengals are moved up to eight and a half now at a couple of the sharp shops. So uh, as we mentioned, uh, we smell something funky with that one. B the Bills, Tennessee, I'm not going to do anything with that game. Uh, I don't have any confidence in Tennessee. And uh, I'm not necessarily a strong believer in Buffalo. Uh, uh, they've been sitting around for an extended period of time and uh, – uh, I just want to see what these teams do. What about you? One of the uh, sound advices in life that I've learned is you never get, you never step in front of a fast moving train. You could get, you could get killed if you cross the railroad tracks. And I've learned that when I, tr uh, I learned that lesson a decade ago. So I haven't fallen in that. But when you see teams that are really, really good, like the old Rams and some of the other teams and stuff, if you try to step in front of them, you're going to lose a lot of plays. So I'm not, it's not that I'm going against Buffalo this week, but I'm not stepping in front of them by, you know, so uh, leaving it alone. Well, I agree with that because, uh, you know, Buffalo, I, I, God, I wish I've got to look this uh, number up, but aren't they like 0 and 7 or something in one score games? 
Uh, yeah, last year, last year, their Pythag uh, indicated that they could have been 13 and a half, uh, you know, wins instead of just what they had. So they were actually better than they were last year. Don't yeah. forget, there's two Monday night games this week. So that Buffalo game is on Monday night. It's a spotlight game. Um, and if you have the weapons like Buffalo does, they'll probably try to put on the show. Yeah, and, and, and they have an excellent track record of wanting to just put the medal to the pedal. Yeah. Or the pedal to the metal. And, <laughs> Something and like they, that. They don't have a problem. They they enjoy beating up on teams that they're able to beat up on. So uh, I agree with what you said. You don't step in front of this freight train uh, if you don't expect the game to be close. And uh, even close games this year, you're going to see some regression where they're going to find a way to win. Last, I, probably the best game of the week, Eagles-Minnesota. Uh, uh, even though these uh, neither of these teams are the best team in the league, it's going to be uh, – uh, it's going to be really interesting with two play on teams uh, in prime time. Uh, I think the easy choice is to get behind those Vikings right away. And we've seen that line drop from three to uh, two and a half, two. Um, what are your thoughts on that game? Anything? Uh, I think it's by far the most fascinating game of the week. I can't wait to watch it as a yeah. fan. Um, I love the situations I have on this game, and I have a lot of Week 2 situations. I have a lot of September Minnesota situations. I have Philly situations. When you add them all up, it doesn't point in one direction or another, which means I can't force a play right now. If the line was three, there would only be one way to look. Um, just Two and a half makes a big difference. Yeah, it makes a big difference in this case. Uh, I like the game. I think there's some unpredictability there. Uh, I think Minnesota's pass defense is a bad is bad for them, but I think they have a great. I project them to have a top four or five a number of sacks, defensive sacks this year. But I also Minnesota, project Minnesota, Minnesota, that they're going to have. Uh, I um, I could look at my sheet. Forty. What do I have for them? 47 projected sacks this this year, wow. which puts them around fourth or third, even third. Um, week one, they had four, so they're ahead of the pace for one week. But uh, I I think they have a vastly underrated defensive line that could get to Hertz. On the other hand, um, Hertz doesn't rely strictly on drop back passes. He's going to move the pocket. He's going to do some things. The secondary from Minnesota may not hold up. Uh, and conversely, when you have Jefferson on one side of the field, one of the dynamic receivers in the game against a Philadelphia defense that allows so many splash plays and Cousins, an accurate quarterback, uh, I think we're talking about some fireworks in this game. And um, there's going to be some variability because of the high number of points that might be scored in this game. Uh, I'm fascinated with the game, not fascinated from a handicapping standpoint. Yeah, this, you know what, I, it's not very often that I sit there and look at a game and say, you know, that, that would be a good game to watch, even if I don't have a bet on it. And uh, yeah, boy, does that fit in the profile? And I'm not a fan of either of the teams in the least, but it just, yeah. you, if you know football, you know that that's going to, that should be a very good, interesting game. Uh, we're, we're running long today, but do you have any other uh, uh, yeah. thoughts? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have two, two things I want to mention. Number one, the beauty of this exercise, what we did, is crystallizing our own thoughts. So I went in kind of with a blank, blank slate to this conversation because I was so wrapped up in doing other things. Um, so this has kind of crystallized my thoughts on some of the games and why I think this is a very tough wagering weekend for me. And I'm not going to press my luck. I've been so thrilled with the way things have been going. But... Number two, we got two games I know that we're going to talk about on Friday. Yeah, uh, Friday we're going to have the uh, Inside Blitz with Ted back on uh, from uh, Sports USA. He does the studio shows. He's uh, currently working and interviewing and gathering information to uh, give him the appropriate con uh, content for pregame and um, mid-show uh, halftime type stuff. And he's going to join us on Friday, and we're going to we're going to uh, discuss those two games and uh, probably uh, some a few odds and ends other than that. So, 
Um, I guess we're, I, I agree with your final comments. Uh, they, there's, uh, I don't feel compelled. I feel better about betting fewer games this week at this point than trying to force any games. Uh, I just yeah. don't have an interest. I, I might do a, a little this and little that, uh, uh, but certainly won't be monumental on my yearly chart. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I like to find edges and exploit them, but if there's no edge, you know, there's not enough I'll, data to find edges I'll and, you on. know, trends yeah. are only going to be so good for us. Yeah. Um, I, I think we touched on some things. It's a little earlier in the week. We touched on some things, uh, that we pointed out that we can then give some thought to and, um, We'll, we'll chit chat later on in the week. And uh, I guess that kind of wraps it up. Uh, appreciate everybody joining us. Um, don't buy whatever we tried to sell you on the show and uh, don't subscribe because uh, then you'd know when we come up with new content. Other than that, we'll be back uh, probably on Friday unless we come up with some amusing topic uh, uh, in the interim. So appreciate everybody joining.